Hi everyone, so let me introduce you to the last talk of the day with Maxim Rossibellum and Damiano Melotti, which will tell us everything about dissecting the modern Android data encryption scheme. Let's give them a warm welcome. Thank you, and uh, uh, hello everyone. I'm really happy to see that so many people made it to the last talk. Uh, so yeah, let's get started. Um, so today we're gonna talk a bit about uh, uh, Android data encryption and uh, um, it's gonna be me and Max who's here next to me. Uh, we both work at Quarks Lab as uh, um, security researchers, um, mostly on uh, low level um, software stuff, uh, it can be Android or similar embedded uh, things. Um, and this research uh, and also this talk was kind of triggered uh, by a question we received uh, after the work we did last year uh, on the Google Titan M chip. Uh, this is a security chip that was introduced in uh, uh, Pixel devices to provide some security features. Um, we were among the first doing some research on it and we published uh, a couple of uh, presentations last year. And someone reached out to us uh, asking uh, whether we would be able to help them uh, retrieve the data on their device after uh, I think it fell uh, in water. Um, so they were doing some hardware work and they realized that the main SOC was dead, but the Titan M chip was actually working. Uh, so yeah, he was uh, seeking for help. And uh, well, our answer was no, we can't help uh, because the main SOC is still essential for uh, disk encryption and decryption. But uh, we were not exactly sure up to what extent this was actually uh, true. So the objective was to find out, basically, find out why uh, the main SOC is essential, how much the uh, secure element, the secure chip uh, is, uh, is used. Uh, and then we wanted to find out, of course, how an attacker uh, would uh, uh, try to break this feature. Uh, so uh, assuming an access to an infinite amount of vulnerabilities, or at least as many as you need, uh, what can an attacker do to get the secrets out of uh, an Android device? And uh, uh, in particular, what's the role of authentication? Is our credentials actually used in the process? How does that work? Uh, so we're going to be speaking about uh, uh, two proof of concepts that we developed uh, to show how to uh, attack this feature using only software bugs, so we won't cover hardware or cryptographic uh, uh, things. Um, and yeah, and we're going to get started with a few elements of background so that we are all on the same page. So we're speaking about data encryption at rest, which basically means uh, that feature that uh, allows the devices uh, to be stored encrypted in your uh, in your file system in practice. Uh, defending, so we are defending from the uh, from an attacker that has full physical access uh, to to the device. Um, the feature is actually quite fascinating. The first time I discovered uh, it existed, it was quite cool to think that data is automatically decrypted uh, and encrypted on the fly when you need to interact with the storage. And this is made possible on Android uh, by two features uh, that were one after the other, uh, full disk encryption and then file-based encryption. That is the standard being used now. Behind those, we have dmcrypt for FDE and then uh, fscrypt uh, for FBE. Now, the, the difference between the two is not really interesting nowadays. It, it's uh, required, uh, FBE is required since Android 10. Um, but giving a, a few more elements on uh, uh, the technology behind, so we said FS script, it, the support ends up being uh, uh, in the uh, Linux kernel and in the file system, ext4 in particular. Um, so everything is at file system level. Um, basically, each file can be encrypted with different uh, keys, uh, and th but each of these keys are derived from a master key, uh, while metadata are encrypted uh, uh, separately using uh, another extension. Um, so the fact that each file has its own key is actually uh, essential uh, to bring up a couple of interesting features that are uh, present in Android. These are, for example, direct boot and multi-user support. Um, direct boot allows to have some files uh, decrypted uh, automatically when you boot the device so that before the user authenticates, authenticates the device can still do some very basic things. Um, and then you can have multiple users, um, also uh, admin uh, uh, users and so on. Uh, and each of these users will have separate keys for their, uh, for their files. Um, so 
this means we have two encryption levels. One is credential encrypted, so the one that protects user data and uh, makes, makes them available only after authentication. And then we have device encrypted data, uh, which are uh, instead automatically uh, decrypted when we boot. So two encryption levels, two keys. Um, the DE key is, as I said, automatically decrypted. There is some uh, hardware derived stuff that will come into the game, but we will mostly focus on the credential encrypted key, which is the one that protects uh, the main data, the, the one that we are interested in. So just to give you a bit of better picture, uh, data, data is the folder where applications are usually storing users' data. And before you authenticate, this is what you're gonna find on the devices. So the file names are encrypted. Uh, this is all garbage, uh, basically. Um, but there are some files that live in another folder, that's the one you see there, that are device encrypted. And uh, these are the files you start on when you need to der derive uh, the actual credential encrypted key. Um, so to reply immediately to one of the questions that we posed at the beginning of the talk, actually these files are combined also with the user credentials, the raw user credentials in the process. So it doesn't matter how many bugs an attacker has, as we said, we assume there can be uh, as many as we want, we, you still need to go through brute forcing to get uh, the final key. So uh, since we're gonna be talking uh, about Trustlet, let's spend a moment to introduce what a trusted execution environment is. I'm sure most of you are already familiar with that, but um, so basically in modern OS features two operating systems. Um, the main one, the one we are used to, in this case Android, runs in what we call the non-secure world, uh, which basically <coughs> allows to run an OS that can uh, have a number of, um, uh, offer a number of uh, opportunities to the user to change it. We can in install applications and so on. But in parallel, we have a secure world where uh, a trusted OS is running, an OS that basically can't be tampered with. There are trusted applications that are signed by the uh, vendor and so on. The idea is that uh, this secure world will have access to some uh, resources that the normal world cannot access, so that there is this kind of isolated environment that we can leverage. And one of the services that relies on the TEE uh, is actually the Android Key Store. So uh, the feature in Android that allows to generate and store uh, cryptographic keys now, keys are always stored encrypted in the Android uh, uh, file system uh, in a form that is called the key blob. Um, and there are three protection levels for these keys. We have software-only keys, TEE, protected keys, which are the default, and uh, hardware-backed keys, which is um, a level that is only available when a security chip is present in the, um, in the device. But the, the bottom line is that the raw key material should never leave the protected environment that it belongs to. So in the case of a TEE uh, key, the raw cryptographic material will only be accessible by the TEE. So to give you a practical example, um, what can happen with a uh, key operation is that the normal world uh, will need to do something uh, with, with a key. So uh, it will talk to the either the key master TA for a TEE key or with the uh, trusted chip for a Strombox key. Um, sending the key blob and, uh, I don't know, for example, the plain text that uh, it wants to, uh, to encrypt. And uh, the key master TA or the trusted chip will extract from the key blob uh, the actual key, use it, and then return uh, the result of the operation without ever uh, leaking the key. Okay, so now that we have kind of put a few things uh, into perspective, let's actually have a look at uh, how the CE key is derived, and uh, um, this is the case where there is no security chip. And like when we say it's complex, uh, we actually mean this, so there are a lot of steps involving uh, a lot of elements that end up being chained together. This is also probably unreadable. So we're gonna zoom in and have a look at some specific parts uh, of the whole schema. And the first part is uh, uh, the one that actually starts uh, with the credentials. So as I said, credentials are used in the process, and when we say credentials, we mean uh, pin, uh, password, or uh, pattern. Uh, if you think about it, when you boot your Android device the first time, uh, you need to provide uh, the, uh, the authentication factor, even if you haven't rolled a fingerprint or a face authentication. That's why they're used here. 
so credentials need to go through a script. Uh, there is a key derivation function. Um, all you need to know about it is that it's just uh, slowing things down and uh, making it costly to perform uh, uh, harder attacks uh, against it. So it's combined with this file that comes from the file system to create a token uh, that will be then combined with yet another file to create uh, what we call application ID. Now, this application ID is only used if authentication is successful. Otherwise, we don't move forward uh, from here. So authentication is perhaps the essential thing at the base of uh, uh, FB. And uh, um, so we're going to have a look a bit uh, into how it's actually happening. In a device without a trusted chip, authentication is handled by the gatekeeper, trusted application. And this trust trusted application basically takes care of receiving uh, what we call password handle. Uh, so uh, the, the handle that is stored in a file, the, what the one we need to try to match, and then the current attempt uh, to authenticate. If successful, and this is actually a, a key point that is going to come up later, Gatekeeper returns an authentication token that is this uh, signed token that will be used uh, essentially by the system to prove that the user has also su successfully authenticated. Um, and then there is also throttling to prevent uh, uh, brute forcing, basically. So uh, graphically, uh, what happens is that the normal world we send uh, a verify uh, request with, as I said, the password handle and the current handle, so the current attempt. The gatekeeper TA will do something like an HMAC um, to verify if the current handle matches the password handle. Um, if so, uh, it will generate this authentication token using uh, a specific key. Uh, otherwise, it will just update its uh, throttling counters, uh, which will make brute forcing, again, impossible. Basically, it, it will remember whenever you try to authenticate, keeping logs on the time and so on. And it very quickly uh, prevents you from doing um, many attempts in a row. Um, so going back to the schema, uh, if you remember, we left, we left it uh, with the application ID. Uh, so if authentication is, suc is, is successful, we're going to use this application ID uh, for something. And that's what we're going to have a look now. So uh, the thing is, you don't want, uh, as a design principle, you don't want to link uh, the final key to the actual credentials. Because what if the user actually changes their um, uh, their credentials, their password, for example. You don't want to re-encrypt the whole system. So there is one thing that lives in between, which is called synthetic password. And uh, uh, this synthetic password is uh, stored also encrypted in the file system, but is actually uh, it needs to go through uh, two decryption phases, one with a TEE uh, protected key uh, that is authentication bound. Uh, so it can only be used when the user has authenticated. And then uh, a second decryption, which starts uh, uses the application ID basically as a key. Um, so if we mm, stop here, here for a second and take a look at uh, this specific uh, step in the key derivation phase, we can start thinking about how we can attack uh, the whole system. And uh, it, it's pretty clear that at some point we need to tamper with the trusted execution environment. We can do it in two ways. Uh, we have the key master, trusted application, which will access uh, uh, this key you see on the left. Uh, so if we manage to uh, tamper with the key master application, uh, maybe we can extract this key. Or we can tamper with the gatekeeper, trusted application, to uh, bypass the authentication mechanism. Uh, so the final goal is to get to the synthetic password and from there on uh, we, will be, we will be uh, ready to get the CE key. So now I'm going to leave the floor to Max so that uh, he's going to talk about our proof of concept, the first one. Thank you, Damiano. So now we understand um, how the credentials are uh, derived into uh, the CE key and, uh, and how the trusting environment is uh, is used to uh, accept the to verify the credentials. So let's let's uh, talk about the first proof of concept we implemented for this research. And um, here, our first goal is to uh, have enough privileges on a device so we can retrieve all the files that are uh, device encrypted and involved in the in this uh, in the steps Damiano described 
like uh, here you can see one of the files, the SP blob file, uh, which is the green box on the top. And we will also uh, need to look into the trust zone. Here we decided to look into the gatekeeper trusted applications. And for that, we need either multiple bugs, uh, like code execution on the device, then a privilege escalation to, to the kernel to, uh, to access all the files and, uh, and then to the trust zone. Or we can also use a single uh, bug uh, that will be early enough in the boot process so that we can bypass the secure boot and patch our way uh, up to uh, the, the kernel and, uh, and the trusted environment. So for that, we decided to, uh, to use these Samsung devices. Uh, these are Samsung A22. Uh, there are actually plenty of them, so we uh, actually tried uh, the proof of concept on these two devices. And the funny thing about this is uh, how we discovered this bug. Uh, we were looking online uh, for uh, Unbrick tutorials because it's often where you will find bugs, uh, basically. And uh, yeah, we saw some people doing uh, stuff that you clearly cannot do without a serious bug. And uh, actually, they were, um, they were repackaging the tool that I will present next. So these devices are uh, using a MediaTek system on chip that uh, actually two different ones that are vulnerable to uh, that have a critical uh, vulnerability in the boot ROM, and uh, yeah, on top of that, this uh, they are running Android for sure, and uh, yeah, this the code is modified by MediaTek and Samsung. For example, you have the trusted OS that is Tigris, which is uh, the, the trusted uh, the trust zone OS designed by Samsung. So. Our vulnerability, uh, actually, we didn't discover this bug. Uh, the, 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 the tool MTK client that uh, we are using here uh, is developed by John Keller. Um, the, the tool is very is super handy, and uh, yeah, for use case, it just works. So we won't give much details on the bug itself. Uh, just for information, it's the bug impacts the protocols uh, that's all um, uh, implemented in the boot ROM uh, in order to unbreak or reflash the devices. In the, in the case of MediaTek, it is called uh, the, the download agent. Uh, but it's also implemented in a different way in other uh, vendors. Now, we are using this tool to rewrite all the partitions we need to patch. And the tool is also uh, doing a lot of, a lot of work uh, for us. For example, it can boot a modified preloader. So the preloader is a second bootloader after the boot ROM. It can boot a modified preloader and patch it to disable some checks that we'll, uh, we will see later on, but basically the next checks uh, of the secure boot. And uh, yeah, so thanks to that tool, we can just uh, we can uh, bypass the secure boot. So let's take a look at the boot process of our uh, MediaTek chip. Uh, so we have the boot ROM that verifies and boots the preloader. And then the preloader will do the same with, first of all, uh, the ARM trusted firmware, which is actually the code running in the monitor mode, so the uh, code running with the highest privileges on the device. We uh, it will do the same with the Tigris, which is a trust zone OS. And finally, uh, it will load a second, a third bootloader called a little kernel, which in turn will verify and boot uh, Android. Now, this last step is more complex than uh, just an arrow. Uh, there are several uh, partitions involved, uh, but yeah, we will stick to uh, one step here uh, for this presentation, but yeah, this feature is called Android Verified Boot version 2. Now, thanks to the tool uh, MTK client, we can exploit a bug in the boot ROM, and the, boot, the, um, the tool will automatically uh, patch a preloader and start it. Then, uh, it, this will disable the verification of the next steps, so now we can uh, patch Tigris, because we want to patch the gatekeeper trusted application. And we can also uh, yeah, disable the verifications into little kernels so that we can then root Android. So let's take a look at how we can uh, patch this. And let's start with the little kernel. So this is a typical bootloader in, in Android. Um, it was used a lot uh, for a while now. I think only MediaTek is using it as a bootloader. And uh, yeah, this, um, this uh, our, our patching strategy is uh, quite simple. Um, we, we simply follow an empirical approach. Uh, we first reverse engineer the, the bootloader. Uh, we, we try to identify where, where are the checks. 
we patch them and we reflash the bootloader and we try to see if we can boot the modify Android like that. And if it doesn't work, we repeat the process. So there is no, uh, the firmware is closed source. Uh, the bootloader is, is a closed source. Uh, there are some sources that exist, but it was modified by uh, MediaTek and Samsung. So uh, the checks that we are uh, interested into are actually not public. And uh, there is no logs or things like this. So the only things we can have is uh, have the, the bootloader print on the screen some JPEGs, like the one you see on the right. So this will give you uh, an, an idea of where, pretty much where in the code you are. So uh, yeah, so after some tries, we, we are able to, to disable completely the verification of Android. And to give you an example of what we have and what we want to patch here, uh, we can see on extract, we have a do hash function that will uh, then produce a hash of something that would be compared to a stored value, uh, if you look at the mem compile line. There are plenty of ways to patch this, but we decided to simply replace uh, the stored value by the hash variable so that it's compared with itself. Now that uh, we, uh, we patch little kernel, we can uh, start uh, to modify Android. And here, Android is based on two images. The first one is the boot image that contains uh, a kernel and a RAM disk. And uh, we have the super image that contains most of the system. It's a dynamic partition, meaning that it contains other logical partitions. And yeah, here, one of these partitions, the vendor one, contains all the, the trusted applications uh, that will be then loaded by Android in the trust zone. So to root it, we are using this famous tool. Uh, you probably already know uh, Magisk. Uh, it works super well, it's very simple to use, and it comes as an Android application that you install on device, and uh, it will patch the boot image, it will uh, install some uh, binaries like uh, an SU binary that you can then use to uh, gain elevate privileges to root. Uh, but when you do so, the, the user will be prompted and will, will be asked to grant or deny the, 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 the permissions. And this will not work on all case because we it cannot unlock the device, uh, so yeah. So we need few patches to make it work from a laptop, and to always accept the privilege escalation. And then once we did this, um, we can boot a device. We can uh, access it. We have access to the all the files, and um, so we can read all the device encrypted files. Uh, yet we cannot brute force the credentials uh, because of this auth token Damiano uh, mentioned. Uh, since key master, the key master task uh, in the trust zone won't decrypt um, the intermediate value. So for this, we need to take a look at into uh, Tigris, the trust zone OS. So again, it is designed by Samsung, and it will you will find it on uh, Exynos devices, but also on MediaTek uh, uh, system and chips. And uh, here we have three images that contains uh, Tigris. So uh, the first one is the TEE image. We have the monitor, the code for the monitor, the kernel a binary called userboot.so. We have an archive called Chizar that contains the root file system. And finally, we have uh, the um, trusted applications and some drivers that are contained into the Android partitions. So if you want to learn more about Tigris, I invite you to read this uh, very good uh, blog post series by Riskure uh, that describes uh, with a lot of details the, the Tigris. So let's go back on this view on of the of the uh, boot and the verification of the images. So we have a preloader that will uh, verify and, and load the what's inside the TEE image. And then at, uh, after the TEE boots, uh, the user boot.so file is used to verify the TSA image, which in turn, uh, th there, will a there is a binary that will be executed, the root task that will verify the trusted applications whenever Android wants to use them. So it will ask to the, the, the trusted environment to load the application and the root task will do the verification. So we want to patch Gatekeeper and to do that, we need to patch all these steps. So the user boot file, the root task, uh, and we will, we will not go into the details on how to patch this, but it's pretty much the same, um, yeah, the, the same methodology as what we did for little kernel. So once we do that, let's take a look at Gatekeeper and how we can um, how we can patch it. So on uh, Tigris, the trusted applications are ELF files that are slightly modified. They have a footer and a header that you can remove to then open them in any um, disassembler. 
and they have a lot of symbols inside uh, because of the usage of libraries, uh, also because of the global platform API that is um, it's a standard for the, the trusted environment, trusted execution environment that describes features like memory allocations, crypto operations, and so on. And uh, so we, we will find a lot of symbols and you will have the documentation for them. So it's very uh, easy for, it make, makes our life of, as a reverser easier. And you also have a reference implementation that is open source that is called Trusty TEE. It's now the trusted uh, uh, the Trust Zone OS for the Pixel devi devices. And uh, here you will find uh, the implementation of trusted applications that are used in Android like Keymaster and Gatekeeper. So let's take a look at them. Um, and yeah, it, it works pretty much like what uh, Damiano described. So we have two commands. The one we care about is verify. Uh, it's used to verify the credentials. And what it does is that it will perform an HMAC of the password handle, and it will compare the results to uh, an expected value that comes from one of the files uh, that are device encrypted. Now this HMAC, it uh, actually uh, it, it is made with a key that is uh, at some point uh, retrieved by the gatekeeper trusted applications. And all the implementation of the HMAC is done inside the, the trusted applications. So what if we can leak this key that is used to perform the HMAC? Then we can perform the HMAC ourselves. And we can come with another strategy to, uh, to brute force the credentials, basically uh, what we have here. So we generate a new password. We HMAC uh, the password handle. There is a bit of work to uh, um, turn the password into the password handle, but it's doable. And uh, then we, we have a value that we can compare it to the expected value. And this should be very simple to implement and it should scale uh, on bigger bigger machines to uh, yeah to be uh, performant so uh, so yeah that's the theory but in practice it's not how it works sadly for us uh, in the Samsung gatekeeper trusted application they didn't use the HMAC they used a function that is called KDF which could be actually an H HMAC behind we don't know uh, what's behind this uh, KDF function because it's, yeah, it's implemented in the library, but the library will call a driver in the kernel, and the kernel, according to some documentations, is um, supposed to, uh, to call a, the crypto processor. Meaning that if we want to leak the key, we have, first of all, we have all the steps. Uh, we need to reverse more things. We need to, yeah, I mean at some point, we need to move forward with this research. Uh, we don't have any infinite time to work on that. So, so, yeah, we decided to go with a simple strategy, which is patching gatekeeper uh, in order to always produce this auth token, because the auth token is not uh, derived from the credentials. All right, so this is an example of what you have in here. I'm using uh, Jidra. Um, so this is the function that performs the, the KDF. All the TEE underscore uh, something are actually uh, functions of the, the global platform API, and uh, yeah, for which you will find documentation. And the only one that is different is the one TES derived KDF, which is the the infamous KDF function. <laughs> All right. So we can summarize our attack strategy as the following. Um, know that we, the auth token, whenever we enter uh, any credentials on the device, the auth token will be produced and shared with the, the other um, trusted applications. So we will place ourselves between the two AES decrypts. We will read the output of the first one, and then we will generate new, uh, new credentials to produce the application ID. And, uh, and then we will pr try to decrypt them. And thanks to uh, the Galois console mode operatory mode that is used here with AES that performs uh, authentication on top of confidentiality, we should, uh, we should uh, know if the key is the wrong one because the, the decryption will fail. So to do this, we are gonna hook a process called system server, which is behind uh, the the, um, the Android runtime, and we are going to use a tool that you already heard uh, of, which is Frida, uh, which is a great tool to instrument functions and uh, it works very well on Android. And uh, yeah, so doing so, we can, we can, as you can see uh, on the screenshot, we can leak what here is called ciphertext by hooking this function, synthetic password uh, crypto uh, decrypt. And, and yeah, that's, uh, that's cool. So, now that we have leaked this value, let's take a look again at the big picture, at the big schema. And uh, for our brute force, we only care about the upper part. And yeah, the part on the right 
is the, we are hashing a, a file, seg this file to produce the uh, hashed secret. This can be, we, we can retrieve the file, so this can be done only once. We don't really care about this for all brute force. Uh, we leaked the first uh, AES decrypt, uh, the result of the first AES decrypt, so we don't care neither of this part. We end up with these steps that we can translate into this uh, pseudocode. So first of all, we generate a new password, we script it to produce a token. Then we, uh, we concatenate this token with the pre-hashed value, so the hashed secret from the previous slide. Uh, to produce the application ID, we hash it to produce a key, and we try to decrypt what is called here value from key master, which is the value we leaked uh, from the first AES decrypt. We try to decrypt it with this key. So if it fails, we go back to step one. Uh, here is an example of, uh, yeah, we made a, a little Python script to brute force uh, to implement that. So the script is really not optimized. Uh, here you can find a very simple password into a li less than 20 seconds, but we are running that on a crazy uh, VM with uh, 30 cores or something like this. And uh, yeah, this, this script can really be improved, but yeah, it, at least it works. Uh, so I'm gonna show you a video a little video of this. I will put it in full screen. All right, so I'm booting the, the device here. It's a normal boot. Maybe I will speed up a bit. No, it's not working. Okay. like this. Ah, cannot use the arrows. It's the demo effect, but with a, d a video. Okay, so the device boots. Yeah, so this is this is just to show that it's a normal device, but you, yeah, you can't really tell. You need to trust us. Uh, yeah, you didn't see that at some point I need to enter a pin, so the device is protected with a, a pin code. All right. Uh, yeah, then we shut down the device. So on this device, we need to shut two pins to enter in this mode to download uh, to uh, access the boot from vulnerability. On the other one, we don't, but we bricked it before uh, recording the video, so we had to stick to that one. So so yeah, now I'm gonna run the script, which uh, in background will first call uh, MTK uh, MTK client. Let's move a bit forward. All right, here I'm dumping the images I want to patch. And uh, I was a bit too fast. Yeah. Then I'm using Magisk to patch the boot, the boot image. Then I'm going to patch uh, the other images. And here I'm just flashing them back on, on the device. So once it's done, I just start the device using, again, uh, the MTK client tool to, to uh, bypass the secure boot. You can see the Quark's lab logo, meaning that something changed in the firmware. Uh, maybe I'll speed it up a bit. Yeah, here I am dumping the files that I need to perform the brute force. Then I will start Frida. Yeah, so we leaked the, auth uh, the intermediate value the from the first AES decrypt, and now we can start the brute force. So here I will move. Uh okay, so we found it. Woo. Uh, so the password is uh, 1106, like the date of today. And uh, yeah, the throughput is a uh, very not not really good because the script is not very good. Uh, also because I'm recording at the same time on my on my laptop. So yeah, 
Ah. Ok, that's Damiano's laptop. <laughs> uh, ok, yeah. Cool. Yeah, quickly, the end is that I first show you that the I have access to the files, but they are all encrypted. Then I, I just enter the password that I discovered, and you should see we have access to the files. Yeah, it worked. <laughs> okay, so um, this is how you can do uh, on uh, uh, when um, the, the verification of the credential is done with the gatekeeper and the trust zone. But what about the security chips? So let's again take a look at this uh, big picture, uh, the architecture, architecture view. Um, so the architecture of the main system on chip is exactly the same. We have the normal, the non-secure world or the normal world that will run the Android. Uh, we also have a trust zone uh, environment, the secure world uh, that will run an OS and also an application like Gatekeeper, uh, not Gatekeeper, but Keymaster. And on top of that, we have a chip on the left that is completely separated. Uh, well, it depends on the, the which device, but uh, on the one we will study, it's completely separated uh, in terms of hardware. And here again, you will have security features implemented. So we decided to focus on the Titan M chip uh, because we already know it, and we discovered bugs uh, that we uh, already presented and reported. And yeah, this chip has been introduced by Google uh, in the Pixel phone, starting from the Pixel 3. Uh, we are going to show you a proof of concept that works on the Pixel 3a, but it should work on all the Pixel devices that has the that have the, the Titan M version one, because yeah, they introduced the Titan M version two, which is really enhanced in terms of uh, security, uh, starting from the Pixel 6. Now, this Titan M is based on ARM Cortex M3, and most of the code is divided into uh, tasks. Uh, we have a keymaster task uh, that is the, the back end of the of the of the key store, and when it relies on the security chip, it's called Strongbox. And funnily enough, it is not used uh, when it comes to data encryption. Ho uh, instead, we have another task that is called Weaver that is used uh, for data encryption to store tokens. Now, Google introduced this, uh, this uh, security chip, um, according to them, to reduce the attack surface and mitigate uh, side channel bugs. Like, uh, yeah, that this is due. Uh, this is due of the fact that the trust zone, the secure world, and the non-secure world will share hardware resources like the RAM, like the, ca the, the CPU cache, and it was shown across plenty of researches that, uh, yeah, it was possible to mess with the secure world from the non-secure world. Here we uh, we give uh, an example of uh, of attack like raw hammer that allows to do that. Titan M is also tamper uh, resistant. So it has, um, it has uh, security features implemented in the hardware level. Uh, for example, there is a shield that is active, so if you open the chip to access the die, it, will be it should be detected. And uh, yeah, so the, the, the hardware is isolated. It's completely different um, than from the main system on chip and yeah, uh, the firmware as well. So yeah, this is how the, the chip communicates with, uh, with the main system on chip, so uh, how the Titan M communicates with the main system on chip, and uh, it uses uh, the hardware bus SPI. On the Android side, you have a kernel driver that will handle the low-level uh, protocol. Uh, it will forward everything to a daemon called Citadel D, which will act as a proxy. And uh, we have what it's called here the HAL for hardware abstraction layouts, which are the demons implementing the, the application part of the protocol. They are most of them using uh, protobuf uh, to do this. And yeah, whenever you have an application that needs to do something like generate a key in the Titan M, it, will, it has to call uh, the, HA, the HAL daemon. It, the, the messages will go all the, all the way up to the Titan M. So this is. Uh, um, the memory layout of the chip, and what is interesting for us today, uh, first of all, is that uh, you can see the arrow and LW, which are the images. Uh, you have a loader and, and the firmware. And all the addresses you see are physical addresses. There is no virtual memory here. Uh, everything is static. 
and um, there is not much RAM, meaning that the code is directly executed uh, from, from the flash. So all these addresses are the ones that you will find in, in the code. And we also have the two regions called SFS, which uh, here you will have a file system that is used to store persistent uh, data, and actually Weaver is storing um, all, the, all, all its secrets here. So now let's, let's uh, focus on Weaver. We can compare it to a dictionary of pairs of a key value. Uh, the keys will be stored in one of the file system, the values in the other. And uh, it's a very simple task. It does, uh, there are four commands. You can uh, basically read write the slots. Uh, you have here an example of the read command, the protobuf definition of the read command. So whenever the system wants to, um, to read a value, it has to provide the slot number and it has to provide the key, which is a byte array of uh, 16 bytes. And if everything matches, uh, the chip will reply with the, um, the, the value, which is also a byte array of 16 bytes, plus some other information like the, an error code and uh, the throttling, uh, because yeah, the throttling is also implemented here, meaning that we cannot just uh, send any keys uh, possible to get, uh, to get the value. And uh, let's take again a look at this big picture, this big schema, which is here slightly modified to take into account Weaver. Uh, actually, it's very similar to the previous one. If we zoom in, in uh, on, on the upper part, which is the only one uh, that differs, um, yeah, we can see that the credentials are, uh, are um, turned into a, a token using the S script uh, function here again. Uh, the only difference is that then the token is used to produce the key uh, with an hash function uh, that will then be sent uh, to the, the security chip along with the slot that comes from a file that is device encrypted. So if it matches, the, the, the chip will return the value. And then this value is hashed to produce the hashed secrets and token and hash secrets are concatenated together to produce the application ID. And starting from there, from there it's exactly the same as uh, what we presented before. Now I will let Damiano continue with the uh, actual proof of concept. Thank you. <coughs> so uh, we're going to show you a bit how to uh, attack the uh, schema this time when a security chip is involved. And uh, um, the, the thing is, unlike previously, uh, we, use we need uh, for sure at least two bugs because uh, the uh, the chip is running its own OS. It's independent, completely independent from uh, uh, from Android. So uh, when the Google said they would uh, increase, they would um, decrease the attack surface. Well, that's actually true. Um, so we consider actually that the device is already rooted. Uh, we can do it uh, with Magisk, and um, it's just for our own convenience. And then. Um, we have an exploit uh, for the Titan M chip. This time the vulnerability was actually discovered by us and uh, was covered in one of the presentations we did uh, last year. Um, it just a few words on the vulnerability. It's an out of bounds write of just one byte that can be set to one. Uh, it was kind of a ride to um, turn this very tiny primitive into an actual code execution exploit. And if you're interested, uh, go check out uh, uh, our blog post on this. Uh, but anyway, being the memory fully static, uh, we can cause a bigger corruption by uh, overwriting a global field. And this basically gives us uh, the, um, uh, the code execution exploit we were looking for. But actually, uh, it is not really uh, too much a matter of executing code of the chip that on the chip that we are interested in, but it's to be able to read its memory. Uh, so basically, uh, what we did was we built a client uh, to communicate with the chip that's called the NOS client. Uh, and it's like used normally to send commands. But on top of that, we built uh, a leak feature that uh, uses the exploit to read arbitrary memory uh, in Titan M. Uh, so with this, uh, we know that uh, somewhere in memory, we have uh, the weaver slots and uh, uh, the values. So they must be stored somewhere. And with a bit of reverse engineering and a bit of uh, debugging, uh, we managed to find uh, uh, where the keys and values are stored and to leak them. 
Um, you can also use Weaver Write and Read to add uh, new slots and uh, then try to look them up in memory. It, this ends up not being too hard. So uh, if this becomes possible, the uh, attack strategy is uh, even simpler than previously uh, because uh, we just need to leak the Weaver key and uh, uh, without thinking about that uh, AES decryption uh, we, we saw earlier with the synthetic password, we just need in this uh, moment to um, uh, com uh, brute force on the uh, leaked Weaver key that we managed uh, to extract. So uh, the, the attack looks a bit like this. We generate the password, we as uh, script it, um, and then we uh, compare it with uh, the hashed uh, token uh, and the key that we leaked. Uh, so yeah, here you see the, the throughput again don't mm, you know don't think about uh, this number too much because they they are uh, just coming from a very uh, non optimized script and most importantly uh, probably a real attacker would use gpus which is not something we did um, so we have another demo another video another awkward moment where we can't play it um, so the thing uh, in, in this case, we have again a terminal and the pixel 3a uh, open. I'm showing the data data directory that is uh, uh, encrypted. Uh, and I am now running the exploit uh, after stopping the uh, Citadel driver. Uh, that is the driver that talks to the chip uh, to leak this, uh, uh, this value that we need uh, for our brute forcing strategy. So let me just stop for a sec. Here, of course, we knew the right offset, but to show you a bit how we found it, this is a, a, a 0x100 uh, bytes, and you can see, like, uh, in this part of the memory, what might be a SHA digest, right? I mean, all the rest is null bytes. There's a bunch of A's, which come from the tries we did. So it, is, it was not particularly hard. So uh, we get to that, uh, to that, num to that uh, uh, buffer that we need to extract. And what is left to be done is to extract the files uh, we need to start from, like uh, Max did uh, in his case. Um, and just uh, yeah, go back to the, the, main, uh, uh, the main laptop, extract these files, uh, reboot the device. This is needed just to kind of restore it in a, in a normal state after we ran uh, the exploit. Uh, but it might not be even be strictly needed. And then we go uh, uh, launching the brute forcing script uh, with the uh, file we extracted and the key we leaked from the Titanium. So this, again, is going to take uh, a while, also because OBS was eating my uh, cores. But at some point, hopefully, you should find out uh, that uh, the code is, uh, is again 1106 and that allows to unlock the device successfully. Okay, so time for the conclusions. Um, so we talked a bit about uh, this FB feature on Android and uh, I think the uh, one of the nicest takeaways is that it's actually a really well designed uh, feature. Uh, it's really uh, interesting to see how ingredients are coming a bit of from everywhere and are combined together in a way that uh, you always need all of them to to get to the end. Uh, so we have some files that are owned by privileged users. Um, we have keys that come from the trusted execution environment. Uh, for which you need authentication tokens, uh, so uh, so you need to 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 tamper with the TEE. And finally, when uh, a trusted chip is available, it is used not directly for the uh, key, so not with the key master uh, task, but to uh, extract a value that is stored securely uh, in this Weaver dictionary. So we need multiple bugs uh, to break to break this feature, or a very powerful one in a device that uh, uh, can be compromised with just a bug. So uh, in the case of a Samsung device, a bootroom bug was enough. In the case of uh, the Pixel, 
at least uh, two, but probably more to get uh, to root on the phone, uh, were needed uh, because of the separation between uh, the main uh, application processor and the Titan M. But still, uh, you need to brute force the credentials. So yeah, if your password is very long, like the one I'm writing here in the slides, well, it will take uh, perhaps a, se a few seconds to unlock your phone, but uh, it will be really hard to guess. And with that, thank you very much, and uh, we are happy to take any questions. So how hard was the gatekeeper code to reverse engineer? Because I know a lot of it is open source, like the daemon is actually open source, part of the Android platform, but I don't know about the rest of the code. Um, yeah, so um, it, it's not public. The, the, I mean, the, the trusted application for Tigris, uh, I think there, is a, there was a leak one or two years ago uh, of that yeah, contains a lot of things uh, from Samsung, including an implementation of the Gatekeeper uh, trusted application for Tigris, but it's an old version. So here we really had to, to reverse engineer it. And uh, yeah, there are plenty of symbols, so it's not really hard actually to reverse. So the only part that is open source, that the big part, is the all, all the schema you, s you have seen comes from uh, Android and that is uh, available in open source. That, that is code. I, I, uh, on one of your slides, I think the, uh, you had the Titan M uh, and you, you had a diagram showing it was connected with the spy bus to uh, the non-trusted part. Uh, have you done any work to know if they actually secured everything that's going on on that bus or were you purely stayed at a software level? Uh, everything is um, non-encrypted on that bus. And uh, yeah, we did, uh, when we presented last year our research on, uh, on Titan M, we did some uh, main in the middle on, uh, on the SPI bus so we could sniff everything that was uh, passing through. Okay, good. <laughs> Thanks.